Hey there, everyone. I am here today with Derek Story, longtime photographer, blogger, podcaster, author, video course creator, and a bunch more. Uh, excited to chat with him today. We're going to talk about photo editing software and choices he has made over the years. I think he has an interesting perspective. Uh, he's not wholly into one specific camp, Adobe or otherwise, and I'm looking forward to exploring that a little bit with him. So uh, before we dive into that, uh, Derek, for folks who may not be familiar with you, why don't you just kind of say hi and tell folks a little bit about your mm -hmm. your background and where you're coming from? Absolutely. Um, I, I came up through the ranks of uh, newspaper work as a photographer uh, actually photojournalist. So I've always written and done photography together. And uh, when the web came about, that proved to be very handy. Uh, <laughs> worked for O'Reilly Media for uh, nearly 10 years uh, as an online editor and a digital media evangelist for them. And then um, last uh, 15 years or so, I've just been on my own. Uh, no more cubicle life for me. And uh, basically, uh, I have a podcast called The Digital Story. That runs every Tuesday, and uh, we have over 860 episodes or something like that, and um, very popular. If you, whatever streaming service you use, it, it'll be on there. Uh, I have a Substack newsletter called The Nimble Photographer. That's every Thursday. And then uh, I do online workshops, physical workshops, all that good stuff. And you can find that at thedigitalstory.com. Good deal. Yeah, you you've been you were one of the first kind of online names I know I connected with in the photography world, and I've followed your different ventures on and off throughout the years. Took one of your workshops in person, you know, probably fifteen years ago. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to go uh, yeah. <laughs> have have coffee with you a few months ago when I was down uh, in your hometown. Mm -hmm. And if I recall correctly, you used to be an Aperture guy. You were a big Apple Aperture user back back when it was basically just Aperture and Lightroom were the two main things that everybody was using and um, yeah it, and then Aperture met its demise <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. as you left Aperture and were looking where to go what what kind of guided you uh, on your on your software journey to find the best way to edit your photos yeah well I mean I was involved with Aperture before there was an Aperture um, I had I was working with David Pogue and we were doing iPhoto books and, and um the Apple people came to me and said, you know, we're we're building this app. We can't tell you what it is or we'll have to kill you, but we <laughs> want to ask you a bunch of questions. And um so uh I I was part of the uh, development of Aperture in terms of you know a photographer they were consulting with. And uh I I really liked what they're doing. The engineers they had on that project were fantastic. I mean, it was it was a beautiful application. And um and, and then I was also uh, you know, in the early days of Lightroom, I went on the Lightroom uh adventure where we tested Lightroom in Iceland, 12 of us, and mm. uh that was sponsored by Adobe. And so we were working with beta software, and the idea was is to shoot all day and then test this beta software at night. And so nice. I've always been with both of them from the very beginning. And when I was with uh, O'Reilly, I had an Inside Aperture website that I did working with Apple. And uh, I mean, I could literally go to the Apple campus, sign in, interview the product manager. At that mm -hmm. time it was Joe Schur. Uh, interview him. And, uh, you know, we could talk Aperture and there wasn't a a PR person in the room and I would edit it up and publish it, <laughs> you know, nice. so you can imagine that kind of stuff doesn't happen <laughs> anymore. Right. right. And I also did a same, same sort of thing with Lightroom. So I, I know them both. I've been part of them since the very beginning and I loved, I loved Aperture. I, I still think Aperture was one of the best designed photo management applications ever. You know, I, I, I haven't seen anything that I like better since and um so when they decided to close the doors on that and there's a whole kind of storied story about that um i you know they're they're trying to sell me they're trying to spin me on photos and i'm just going look honest don't do that but mm -hmm. it was 
as it stands right now at 1.0 isn't even as good as iPhoto. So, you know, <laughs> let, let's, let's not even go down that road. So I had to do something else. I wasn't a huge Lightroom fan because I didn't like the, the modal aspect of it. I didn't like having to be in one module and then another module, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So um, I started getting interested in Capture One and uh, Capture One then wasn't nearly as popular as it is now. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I like niche products, you know, as an educator and as a trainer, someone who does movies for LinkedIn now, it used to be lynda.com. You know, if I, if I make Lightroom training, I'm competing with, you know, how many guys and gals? Right. If I do Capture One, you know, like it's pretty much me and maybe one other guy. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just more interesting to do something that's off the beaten track. But as it turned out, I, I really like the Capture One software uh, a lot. And I think a lot of Aperture users are have migrated to Capture One because it feels like Aperture in many ways. So um, the raw processing on it is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, the way you organize your stuff is pretty good. And, um, but when I'm at a workshop, I mean, I, I have to help people with their Lightroom apps, you know, right. when we're doing our processing and stuff. So it, you know, there's personal preference and then there's professional, you know, versatility. Right. And, um, uh, my personal preference is with capture one, but you're right. I, I, I don't have any religion on any of this stuff. It's, it's software, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're right, tools. Right. And, uh, uh, I like to use the best tools for the moment. Uh, just mm -hmm. as a side note, uh, I mean, photos over the years has evolved nicely and has done a lot of stuff. And the editing modules for it are fantastic. You know, the editing extensions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I use photos for all my iPhone work and, you know, with uh, iCloud backup. So I just like to use the best tools that are available. Right. That makes sense. And, you know, there, you know, I, I have yet to run across a piece of photo software that does the best job at everything, regardless of manufacturer, right? You know, yeah. at, at, at any given moment, one might have an advantage in a certain area, but that, and that will change over time, you know, so whether we're talking about doing, you know, black and white or raw processing or just, you know, general editing or, you know, retouching a portrait or whatever it is, you know, different tools are going to be, you know, more advantageous at different points. If you like iPhone photography, I mean, I love shooting with my iPhone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have all my other cameras, but I love shooting with my iPhone. They're fantastic. Right. And right. Um, I'm not going to run my, I'm not going to set up to run that through Capture One Pro. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't even make any sense for me to do it through Lightroom. So, mm -hmm. you know, in that case, you know, photos in iCloud backup and then sharing across all my devices. I mean, that that's a no brainer. And, you know, and why why hold a grudge against one piece of software or another? Just I mean, a lot of people hold grudges against photos because of Aperture, you know, mm -hmm. you know that somehow they're getting back at Apple. Uh, and <laughs> right. uh, I remember someone told me once that. uh you know, hating something doesn't make any sense. It's like you drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You know, it's it's, <laughs> it, 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 it's illogical. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that makes sense, right? And like, if you're mad about Aperture, the fact that you choose not to use photos on your iPhone isn't going to hurt Apple one bit. You still bought an no. iPhone from them and they're still going to keep making photos. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I, you know, that's the irony. The, the I mean, they don't make any money off photos at all. Right. It's there to sell to sell iPhones and Macs, you know, which you've already done. <laughs> you've right. already bought that. So Exactly. So, so you I mean, mentioned ke yeah, ketchup is fr ketchup is free at Burger King, you know, and <laughs> so I mean, why eat your fries without it when you know when they're just going to give it to you? Exactly. So you mentioned that Capture One is your, you know, your current personal preference as far as most of your editing goes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that said, I know you also experiment with a lot of different tools. Um, 
you know, other than Capture One, are there other pieces of software or some key plugins or anything that you really find yourself using over and over again right now? Oh yeah, there's there's so much great stuff out there. I mean, On One has been doing a fantastic mm -hmm. job mm -hmm. uh, with their software. I mean, I really, I really like what they're doing uh, in the last two years, and I'm a big fan of On One Effects in particular. Uh, it's so versatile. Uh, it plugs in mm -hmm. to Capture One. It plugs into Photos. And uh, I teach both uh, an infrared photography workshop and a black and white photography workshop. Those are online workshops. Mm -hmm. And uh, we use On One Effects, uh, you know, for our IR processing. Um, you know, most of nice. us do. Uh, some people still use Photoshop. But... Um, you know, and then I can turn around and do something else with it. Uh, so I, I, I love on one effects a lot. Um, I still like what uh, DxO is doing with a uh, silver effects pro, mm -hmm. the, the latest iteration of that. And I know some folks uh, got a little miffed with DxO because they were getting that whole suite for free with Google, but Google wasn't doing anything with it. Right. Right. DxO spent a lot of a lot of software engineer hours to go through and update the code make it work on our current computers mm -hmm. um improve the ui they did a lot of stuff to it um and uh it, that that suite is really good right now um in particular silver effects uh, 4 i believe so i love that stuff and then um i i still like luminar uh, a lot, and I use Luminar as an editing extension in photos, especially if um, you know I just want to play with a photo and and see what I can do with it. And mm -hmm. you know the a the AI uh, tools in Luminar just help me kind of figure out you know what the possibilities are with images. And so um, you know those are those are software applications that are really nice. And then the last one, of course, is DxO itself, their Photo Raw app. And, um, you know, they're, they have, they do a lot of good things as well. And, uh, their film pack is, is nice too, if you like analog work. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, I mean, these software companies are, are not fooling around. They're doing good work. Uh, Pixelmator, uh, a lot oh, of yeah. people sleep on Pixelmator and it's very super affordable and has a lot of AI built into it and runs great on Macs and, um, iOS. So yeah, if if you're gonna limit yourself, you're gonna you're gonna miss a lot of fun. Yeah, there's a lot of good options out there. I mean, yeah, and, and when you mentioned DXO and Silver Effects, you know, I, I, Silver Effects is kind of my black and white tool of choice that I've used for. Well, I used it back in the day when it was Nick Software originally, and then as you alluded to, Google purchased them and eventually made it free and didn't really do much with it for a long time. And then they got acquired because it, it turns out, you know, companies like Google and that they have all these little side projects, but it's not really core to their business and it's not super important to them. And, you know, I think along the same lines, a lot of people used to really love Snapseed as a photo editor on their mobile phone. Um, and I used to use it myself at one point, but at this point, it's pretty much abandoned. I don't think Snapseed for iOS has been updated in over a year. It doesn't fully support the latest, you know, uh, the latest phones, the latest file formats and things like that. And it turns out that if you want good software, you need to pay a company that cares about investing in that with good software engineers. So, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I think the, the trick is, um, is to how can you put together a workflow that, you know, feels efficient mm -hmm. and, um, you know, but yet gives you a, the versatility that you want when you're processing your images. And that's why, you know, for me, software that can serve as a plug to my core app, in my case, Capture One, mm -hmm. you know, one of the reasons why I like On One so much is because, you know, it it does round trip with Capture One, and that's just you know super fantastic. And I can turn around and use that same software on one in um in my Photos app. So you know when 
when you can kind of piece something together where you're not wasting a lot of time fooling around, you know, you know where your stuff is, you know what your options are. Um, I think workflows can accommodate, you know, three, four, five different pieces of software. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just how it's just how you build the workflow. Right. Yeah. I've really found in my workflows, the one sticking point and where, where I've gotten into trouble sometimes is if I have a workflow where I end up with files in too many different places. So when things don't nicely round trip or when they don't integrate well, uh, you know, sometimes I'll end up with, you know, I've got my, my Lightroom catalog here, but I've got photos over there. And then I take something out to another piece of software and it saves it off yeah, and maybe yeah. I forgot to re-import or something. And so uh, I feel like as long as you think about that consciously, as you tweak your workflow or try out new software, as long as you understand what's going on and figure out if that's going to, you know, help or hurt you, you can, you don't need to limit yourself just to one piece of software for that reason. So. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, I, this is another reason why uh, I'm not a huge fan of Lightroom for my go-to app. Um, I used managed libraries for Capture One, and of course, Photos is, is a managed library. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just so much easier. I've got a Synology, you know, RAID unit in in my workflow, mm -hmm. and I can just back up that whole package, no matter what I do. So if I'm round tripping to on one out of Capture One, all all that work is in the managed library and it's just one container right and uh then i can just you know i just have to watch that one container i keep it in a couple different places um you know photos is uh all goes to icloud and i used optim optimized you know rendering so the masters live in the cloud and then um you right. know I'm just working with optimized images so i because i you know i don't want my files all over the place so mm -hmm. you know and i've basically got them in two places and uh, makes it a lot easier to manage that way. Makes sense. Makes sense. I feel like we can't talk about photo software in 2023 without talking about how we pay for it. Um, you know, and Adobe mm -hmm. with the creative cloud suite was one of, you know, one of the first big companies with a big widespread piece of software to switch entirely to a subscription model. Uh, and that was, I mean, I think that was 10 years ago at this point. I, I did a video, I'll drop a link down below, where I, I looked at, like, what has Adobe done since they switched us all to a subscription model on for Lightroom and for Photoshop? They were one of the first, but as we all know, in that 10-year period, at this point, it's almost the exception rather than the norm for a company's software to not be a subscription model. And... Uh, you know, I think the latest one that's kind of caused a little bit of a kerfluffle in the photography industry is, is Capture One, where they have said they're going to have perpetual licenses, but the one you look at it, it's not really perpetual. It's only a period of time. And then, you know, they're, they're trying to get you to move to subscriptions. But, you know, as you said earlier, we don't want our software to become a religion and we want to use the right tool for the job. You know, how do you feel? I mean, are you are you good with subscriptions at this point? I mean, I think we'd all prefer not to keep paying for our software, but you know, I also think a lot of companies have yeah. kind of shown that that's the way they can perhaps have the most sustainable business. Well, I mean, you know, you, you look at Adobe's just their their earnings report, their last earnings report, right. and you can see why everyone wants to go to subscription. I mean, it's, it's been an absolute home run for them mm -hmm. financially. And so, you know, and everyone else is looking at that and they're going, you know, uh, we, we want to, we want to make money too. So on, on that level, on the business level, I totally get it. And I understand it. Um, I'm not a huge subscription person myself though, uh, even though I'm forced into it sometimes I, prefer perpetual licenses uh, mainly because of the way that I use software and I I might not have to update you know every release right uh, I mean I know when I get new cameras like I got the OM1 you know when it came out the OM system OM1 and mm -hmm. so then I need to have software that can accommodate those raw files and you know that causes me to update but I'm probably 
going to stick with that camera and my X100V, my Fujifilm, for for quite a while now because they're both such good cameras. Mm -hmm. So I I may not need to to update. And uh, you know, and, uh, sometimes the new features are alluring, but sometimes I don't need them. I got another piece that'll do that. So I I personally I just like having the option. Um, but if they are going to do subscription, then I think they need to do it the way Adobe does it because for ten dollars a month, which is basically what I pay for the photography plan, right? I mean, I get Lightroom, I get Lightroom Mobile, I get Photoshop, and uh, just a just a <laughs> just a little bit of cloud storage. I don't mm -hmm. really use it much. Um, so that's you know, I I think that's really reasonable for some serious state-of-the-art software uh whereas i think what capture one is doing you know they've always been more expensive but it's feeling like I, I i was able to work around that expense by not always upgrading mm -hmm. and i think as they try to push us to subscriptions you know that's going to that's going to increase my my costs a fair amount and then the other side to it, which we all know, is that everything is subscription. So, you know, we have Netflix, we have, you know, Apple right. TV, the Plus, you know, we have uh, our software. We, you know, it just kind of goes on and on. And I actually did a spreadsheet in December of everything that I was subscribed to. And, um, you know, it, it, it adds up to be quite a bit. And, you know, I did that so I could kind of figure out what I could live without. Mm hmm. And I just feel like people feel like they're getting subscribed to death uh, because everyone is is going to that model. And, uh, you know, it's so easy to lose track of how much you're spending with the subscriptions, you know, everywhere. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, you know, a couple of things you said really stood out. Yeah, like you said, everybody's moving to subscriptions for everything, whether it's photo software, other software, other services, uh, you know, password managers, you know, accounting software, any of that kind of thing. Everybody wants it to be a monthly or a yearly fee. And uh, like you, I, mm -hmm. you know, as part of kind of my business bookkeeping, at one point I, I made a spreadsheet of like, here's all of the subscriptions I have for my business and started looking at that. And it's like, A, when are they coming due? And B, is that really still worth it? Because, you know, ultimately it comes down to what is the value you're getting out of it and what is that price point? I 100% agree that Adobe's $10 a month photographer plan where you get, you know, Lightroom, Photoshop, you know, the cloud sync, the mobile versions, um, you know, that, that feels very reasonably priced for me. For somebody who's serious about their photography, whether it's as a business or just as a serious hobbyist, $10 a month seems like a reasonable number there. I keep finding a lot of other companies though, that where their software is, you know, much less fully featured than say Lightroom or Photoshop or something like that. And they want you to do like a, you know, 50, 60, $70 a year subscription. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, those, those are the ones that really add up, you know, cause it's like, I'm not I'm not sure well, that's worth, in their... I'm not sure that's worth it for a single purpose plug-in maybe or <laughs> something like that. Well they're they're really kind of going after us on the iOS software too. Uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of kind of cool software and, and I mean I don't want to pay a subscription for my you know my journal on my phone, you know that you know where I enter my journal entries and stuff right. like that. Uh, you know, so, you know, all of those are, you know, nipping at our heels too. Yeah. It, it's, you know, and it's, and it's hard, especially for hobbyists too, right? I mean, if, if you're running it as a business, I feel like you can look at it and really, you know, it, it's more quantifiable, you know, is this tool a good return on my investment for my business, right? Is it going to help me make money such that it makes financial sense to do it. I think it's harder when folks are photography hobbyists. You know, we all know there's so many different ways to spend money in photography. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at some point, software subscriptions become a big part of that. And the reality is you don't need them all. You can make some really great art and, you know, and photos without having 15 different software subscriptions to go with it. 
So. Yeah, and um, especially if you're shooting with an iPhone as part of your workflow, I mean, things like being able to do handheld, you know, ND photography like you can do with uh, the iPhone and, and, and also in my case, the OM1. Mm -hmm. um, being able to change the depth of field and post with iPhone pictures shot in portrait right. mode where you have a slider where you go from, you know, whatever, 1.8 to F11. Um, you know, I mean, that's, that's pretty crazy stuff. Yeah. A lot of times it's not a case of needing more software. It's a case of needing to really explore and become more proficient with the yeah. software we already have. Yeah. <laughs> Knowing what you got, knowing what you got. Yeah, that's, that is a big part of it. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, my workshops do so well, because essentially that's what we do on the online workshops. You know, we meet once a week and uh, we keep it to 10, 10 or 11 folks. And uh, it's not only what I've discovered, but it's also what they've discovered. And then we compare notes and stuff. And and you you get to know the the stuff that you already have in a whole new way and you go wow i never thought never thought to use it that way or i didn't even know that feature was there um you know and that's where spending time with other people birds of a feather kind of thing can really be helpful because i mean we can only watch so many youtube videos we can only mm -hmm. train so much i mean the problem with the, or the challenge i should say with video straight video training is you don't get to ask a question during class mm -hmm. um you know so you you get whatever you get and then that's it that's fine it, it definitely has a place and i think it has a you know a, a very useful place i mean i i wouldn't know how to change the taillight bulb in my audi if i didn't look it up <laughs> on youtube right? right i mean so i mean there's all that stuff but then there comes a point if you where you you know where the interaction is nice as well in addition to whatever you learn via training and you know that's the, the the challenge with my linkedin training i do it i put it out there people can watch it but then it's that's sort of frozen in time and um and so if you can find a way to interact with other people uh, who are doing the same thing that you're doing i think it's helpful when we to learn what we already have and how to explore it in a more, you know, meaningful way. Right. Because ultimately, regardless of which software we're using, whether we're paying Adobe for a monthly subscription, whether we've bought some standalone software, whether we're using Apple photos that we get, you know, for quote unquote free along with our, you know, thousand dollar smartphone. Um, ultimately it's all about, making art. It's all about making our photos for fun or to make a photo for a client based on what they want. And like you said, I think the community is a big piece of that. And there's so many different ways to have that interaction. You know, you referenced your, you know, your online workshops. I know you also have a, uh, you know, kind of a community of your supporters for your, your podcast ventures where folks can interact. There are countless photo meetup groups pretty much everywhere there are more yeah. formal groups I, I just got back from imaging usa which is you know the professional mm -hmm. photographers of america annual convention and they have affiliate groups all around the country and around the world that yeah. people can connect with um, any of these places you know it, my take would be you know if you're not involved with anything find a community of like-minded photographers somewhere whether it's online or offline um you know, and, and you can all learn and grow together because that's, that's ultimately what it's about. It's about having more fun, making more pictures that fit the vision that you have in your head, regardless of how you do it when it comes down to a software standpoint, that's, that's kind of secondary. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's fun to nerd out with other photographers and, uh, you know, it, when, um, Make Magazine first came out, you know, from Arai, you know, and the whole maker thing was really, mm -hmm. was really getting big. I remember that the publisher, you know, that I worked with there, his name's Dale Doherty, and he was my boss for a couple of years there. And he said, you know, the thing about it is that not everyone is going to build a deck in their backyard, right, themselves. 
but people like knowing how to build a deck you know i mean they like <laughs> they like a certain kind of people like knowing how things work and you know even though they may not do that it's fun it's fun to learn that and um and, and i think the photography communities are that way too i mean you're right uh, i set up communities on i have a i run a mighty networks site so everyone that's ever been in an online or physical workshop has access to that site for forever and um you know so sometimes you know you're just kind of cruising that thing and someone's working on some crazy project and it's like interesting like really i never never really thought to do that or that's kind of fun or if you if you hit a wall on something in the middle of the night you've got a place to go to just kind of post it and say you know i don't anyone else ever done this before mm -hmm. and it, you know and there are other folks that you know would actually be interested in your your question or whatever you're working on and it's nice to have that i think it it keeps us enthused and you know kind of keeps us engaged in you know our craft it does it does it's been fun chatting about this so i know you mentioned it at the beginning but just to kind of remind folks kind of your your digital home is uh, the digital story.com and i assume that's probably the best place for folks to go to find out more about what you're up to i'll I'll drop a link down below as well for that. Okay. Is that is that kind of the home for everything? Is there anywhere else they should check out that we should be it, sending it is them? Because up in the up in the menu bar there, you know, the top nav bar, digital story, you know, it it'll click over to the workshops page. It'll click over to Nimble Photographer. It'll click over to, you know, Instagram. You know what? You know all the stuff I'm doing is there. Yeah. So if you just you know, if you go there, then you can find whatever else is going on. Perfect. Perfect. And, you know, you've been doing this long enough. I've seen you experiment in different places. It's nice to kind of have that one, that one home that's kind of the hub for all your online mm -hmm. stuff that people can, can find you in the different places. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. And that's where the podcast is too. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You were one of the one of the original big photo podcasters and have kept it going for, I mean, as you said, you know, over 800 episodes at this point, that's, that's a commitment. That's a chunk of work. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and yet, and yet there's yeah, still new interesting stuff to talk about every week, every week, every week, <laughs> there's something, you know, I never, I never thought that, uh, that I would have 800 and some odd episodes in me, but, uh, every week there's something. Good deal. Well, thank you again, Derek. I enjoyed chatting with mm -hmm. us. Uh, for those of you who aren't already following along here on the YouTube channel, you know, you can subscribe down below. Um, I'll have something new and interesting back at you again soon. Until then, everyone take care.